Welcome, my name is Lynn Nygaard. I'm the director of the Center for Mind, Brain and Culture, and we're delighted to welcome Dr. Elise Piazza to the CNBC and to Emory. Um, Dr. Piazza is currently an assistant professor in brain and cognitive sciences at the University of Rochester. She received her BA from Williams College and her PhD from University of California at Berkeley. She went on to conduct postdoctoral research as a CV star postdoctoral fellow in the Princeton Neuroscience Institute at Princeton, um, coincidentally, um, before joining the Rochester faculty in 2020. Um, in addition to her impressive number of publications, just her sheer productivity, Dr. Piazza's research has appeared in the top journals in the field, in current, uh, including current bio or current biology, developmental science, and psych science. And among Dr. Piazza's many awards and honors, she's the recipient or was a recipient of an Eric and Wendy Schmidt Transformative Technology Award and has secured a recent grant, I couldn't help mentioning this, um, investigating um, audio mo motor integration during natural music performance from the Grammy Museum, right? So she's a Grammy Award winner. Um, uh, so she's shaking her head, yes. Um, yeah, Dr. Piazza's research um, focuses on the cognitive and neural mechanisms of human auditory perception and communication across the lifespan. And her body and work uh, of work includes investigation of how our brains and behaviors become coupled to one another during everyday interactions. Um, and this includes interlocutors in you know, speech events or um, how musicians coordinate during performance. She uses a variety of uh, methodologies, but has really innovated the investigation of coordination by simultaneously measuring the behaviors and brain activity of multiple people during um, real life interactions. Um, her work extends um, to an interest in how our brains generally organize the statistics of natural sounds, such as speech and music, and how experience impacts our representations of complex auditory signals. So for example, how musical training might impact the hierarchical organization of sounds in the brain and um, how listeners compute statistical summaries are just representations of complex sounds. So I'm gonna quit talking so that we can actually hear um, Elise's work, but the title of her talk today is Interpersonal Synchrony, a Framework for Understanding the Dynamics of Everyday Communication and Learning. And uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Elise Piazza. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lynn, um, for inviting me and for that warm introduction. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, obviously wish we could be together in person, but I really enjoyed my meetings today and I'm excited to share my research with you. And if you have any brief clarification questions as I go, feel free to bring those up. So real life communication is extremely complex. If you take this everyday scene from a young child's life, somehow this adult speaker has to transfer her story to these listeners' brains. This requires a multitude of processes on both sides. So as the listener, it's this little girl's job to somehow track the unique statistics or gist of her teacher's voice and separate it from all the other noises in the room, like the other kids giggling and shouting around her. And this is especially challenging early in life as kids are still learning to segment speech into meaningful syllables, words, and narratives. Then as the speaker, it's this teacher's role to pay attention to each child's eye contact, facial expressions, and vocal feedback to instantly adapt or tailor her speech on the fly based on how well her message is being received and understood. So maybe if the kids look bored, she'll contort her voice to impersonate different funny characters in the story. So clearly this process of communication is a two-sided dance of attentional, perceptual, linguistic, and social factors. And I want to know what shared and complementary mechanisms do these two people have to use to pull it off? So my research integrates both the listeners and the speakers' perspectives into the study of communication between multiple brains in natural social environments. And this is a huge problem to solve. So my lab tackles it using a broad set of tools, including behavioral, neuroimaging, and computational methods. 
So I approach communication from two sides at once because both people involved in an interaction need to bring something to the table. The listener needs to efficiently process complex communicative input and the speaker needs to make it easier for the listener by simplifying their output. So on the side of perception or processing, some of my past work has looked at how we transform complex social signals, which can include speech sounds, semantic information, gesture, gaze, into concise representations. And I've studied several efficient mechanisms that both adults and children use to perceive complex naturalistic input. These include statistical learning, by which we break complex streams of input into meaningful chunks, statistical summary, which allows us to quickly perceive the gist of complex sounds, and adaptation by which we calibrate our perception to the current environment to enhance contrast in the world. Then from the perspective of someone producing communicative signals, I'm interested in how we adapt to our audiences to meet their unique needs. And one well-known example of this is infant-directed speech, by which adult speakers adjust their vocal statistics and semantic content to better communicate with young listeners. But of course, these two parts of communication, processing and production, don't happen separately. They obviously interact in real time. And understanding this integration is the main driving force behind my current and ongoing research. So I'll spend the majority of my talk discussing this middle section of the diagram, a framework which I think has the potential to transform our understanding of human relationships, teaching and learning, communication disorders, and a variety of creative processes. So here we use neural coupling or brain-to-brain -brain synchrony as a primary measure for understanding how multiple people's brains and behaviors dynamically sync up with each other during real life communication. And we've applied this framework to caregiver child interactions, early language learning, musical coordination between performers and listeners. And at the end of the talk, I'll expand on some ongoing applications to creativity as well. To study live naturalistic interactions, we've developed and applied a broad set of tools, as you'll see, including dual brain neuroimaging paradigms, musical instruments designed to be played in the scanner, and signal processing, natural language processing, and other machine learning models to capture the fine-grained statistics of communicative signals. So before I dive into coupling, I want to just give you a brief glimpse into one prior study on speech production that illustrates how we can use audio signal processing and machine learning approaches to capture how speech signals shift during live naturalistic interactions. As you'll see, capturing the statistics of rich multimodal communicative signals and relating them to neural representations is gonna be a key component of the integrative neural coupling framework going forward. So here we were interested in how parents adapt their voices while using motherese or baby talk, infant directed speech, which is a specialized mode of communication um, with babies. And other researchers have extensively studied differences in pitch and rhythm between adult and infant directed speech, finding that IDS on the bottom here has higher and more variable pitch as well as shorter, more rhythmic utterances. But one overlooked communicative cue is timbre, which is really critical for quickly getting the high level gist of voices for tagging a specific person or a specific mode of speech. And this provides a great case study for statistical processing in real life communication. Many people know timbre from its importance in music. This is what helps us distinguish different musical instruments from each other, even when they're saying the, playing the same pitch, such as a warm clarinet versus a bright saxophone. Hopefully you can hear those sounds, okay. And the same idea applies to vocal timbre, which helps us instantly identify a friend's unique voice in a crowded room. And many celebrities are known for their idiosyncratic timbre. For example, Fran Drescher's famous nasal voice. Hello, I'm Fran Drescher, I'm checking in. And here's Tom Waits. Sometimes there's nothing left to do. One critic described his voice as sounding like it had been soaked in a vat of bourbon, left hanging in the smokehouse for a few months, and then taken outside and run over with a car. So obviously timbre evokes these very vivid, emotionally colorful aspects of sounds. Then if we listen to three different individuals saying the same syllable for one second, 
ba 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 even though the duration pitch and loudness are the same there's something left over that clearly distinguishes them gives them these different flavors and that's their timbre and you can see visual evidence of this in the spectrograms although they're all the same pitch so they have those same harmonic multiples of f0 the distribution of energy or intensity shown in yellow is different across the three and in particular the third voice has relatively more intensity in the higher harmonics which relates to the tinny kind of nasal quality of that person's voice so if different speakers have different timbre fingerprints we wanted to know if we can capture the distinct fingerprints of infant directed versus adult directed speech so we brought mothers into the lab, asked them to interact naturally with their infants and also talk to an adult experimenter. And then we analyzed short utterances of their speech. And one group of mothers spoke only English. Another group spoke um, a range of diverse languages from around the world. And we used a signal processing approach for extracting timbre in terms of the overall shape of the vocal spectrum. The basic goal here is to represent the gist of each speaker's overall vocal timbre as a concise set of values. And I mentioned previously how the relative energy in these different harmonics, uh, basically how yellow these different horizontal bands are, relates to different people's vocal quality. So we created a vector that represents the weights on these different bands, basically how important they are. And if we see that the vectors differ significantly across utterances of ADS versus IDS, then we think that we're pulling out some global shift between the two modes. So here are those vectors or timbre fingerprints that we get from one speaker. Um, the dashed lines show each individual utterance. So ADS in blue, IDS in pink. And then the bold lines are the average data across utterances. So eyeballing this pattern from one mother, it looks like the ADS and IDF, IDS curves do have different shapes. And to statistically test whether these curves are reliably different in their shapes across speakers, we use support vector machine classification to discriminate these two modes across all the mothers. And our classifier was indeed able to predict whether each utterance was infant directed or adult directed, just from the statistical summary representation of Tamar alone. And even more interestingly, a classifier trained to distinguish ADS from IDS on just the English data set could discriminate those two modes of speech when tested on data from another from, from the other languages and vice versa. And this is a key point. It shows that the pattern of timbral code switching generalizes robustly across languages. So in this study, we found that mothers shift the statistical properties of their overall voice quality when speaking to infants, demonstrating a new feature of infant-directed speech. And the form of this shift was highly consistent across 10 diverse languages from around the world. And because we were able to discriminate modes of speech using a concise statistical measure, this could allow researchers to automatically decode a diverse range of speech modes from just a few seconds of natural data, like whether someone is speaking to a spouse, a boss, or a student. Or you could actually apply this to educational software by adjusting the timbre statistics of a teaching agent's voice, maybe to optimize learning. And in the studies I'll discuss next, you'll see the critical importance of capturing and quantifying the statistics of dynamic communicative signals for understanding interpersonal neural coupling. So I've just illustrated one example of the kind of audio signal processing and machine learning tools that we can use to uncover real-time shifts in communicative signals in a variety of naturalistic paradigms. Now, the core of my work takes an integrative approach to investigate dynamic coupling between multiple people's brains and um, behaviors. So next, I want to highlight two recently completed studies in which we explored the role of neural coupling in caregiver child interactions, as well as language learning in early development. Then I'll present an ongoing study in which we're exploring another powerful domain of communication, music, by comparing the neural representations of performers and listeners. So I want to start out by describing a couple of different ways that neural synchrony has been measured and used to predict communicative outcomes in the literature. And there are two broad categories of synchrony between multiple observers, we'll call them listeners, and between speakers and listeners. 
So for example, in a recent study using pupillometry, we found that the more synchronized a toddler's pupil responses were with a group of toddlers during exposure to novel words, the better they learned those words. And this measure of synchrony between listeners is thought to isolate a signature of attentional engagement to the dynamics of a natural stimulus. So basically, if you're a subject who's more synchronized with the rest of the group, that probably means that your brain is tracking the stimulus in a more typical and maybe ideal way. So it makes sense that the more synchronized subjects might learn content better. If you're not synchronized with the rest of the group, it could be because you're tuned out, so you might learn less effectively. Now, other studies have shown that the degree of neural synchrony between speakers, or you could say producers and listeners or observers, um, I'll just call them speakers and listeners for simplicity. This directly relates to how well they actually understand each other. And specifically in this study, an adult speaker told a real life story in the fMRI scanner. And then a bunch of adult participants later heard that story while being scanned on a separate day. And interestingly, the listeners whose brains were most synchronized with the speaker's brain also understood and remembered the story content better. So overall, neural synchrony seems to provide a measure of getting on the same page with others and aligning our neural representations of the world. And the first study I'm going to discuss now focuses on speaker-listener synchrony or coupling, and the second on listener-listener synchrony. So fMRI has proven to be a powerful tool for cognitive neuroscience, but it's highly limiting when you're trying to study multiple people interacting face-to-face, -face, and also when studying young children who don't tend to lie sit, so easily sit still in the scanner. So we've started to use functional near-infrared spectroscopy. Um, FNIRS is a non-invasive method that involves directing near-infrared wavelengths of light into the head through these emitters. Some of this light is absorbed by the hemoglobin in the blood, and so measuring how much of it is reflected back out into the detectors gives you an indirect measure of cortical activity. And the elliptical path that you see here in red corresponds to an FNIRS channel or region of activation, which is roughly analogous to a very large voxel in fMRI. The nice thing about FNIRS is that it's minimally susceptible to motion, so it allows participants to move and interact quite naturally. And in our first developmental study using this method during my postdoc at Princeton, we had one-year-old infants interact with an adult experimenter during a series of naturalistic tasks. So playing, singing, and reading a short storybook. And it's important to note that this adult was an experimenter who had extensive experience working with kids, but she was not their actual parent. And she interacted with a total of 18 infants across separate sessions. So first we predicted that the neural signals of the infant and adult should be synchronized when they directly interact and communicate with each other, but not when they don't. And also we performed fine-grained analyses of behavioral cues in the videos, as you'll see, such as mutual gaze, infant smiling, and adult speech prosody, to explore how the strength and dynamics of neural synchrony will reflect ongoing social behaviors. So for fun, I wanted to play you a couple of adorable clips from these interactions. This is from the playing phase. Maybe we'll find another friend? Yeah. Who is this? Oh, this is Froggy. Hi. Hi, Froggy. Hi, you green frog. Who are you? I'm a lion. And this is the singing phase. One of us go round and round, round and round. Round and round the wheels on the bus go round and round all through the town. And our main measure of interest here was brain to brain synchrony. So, how did we compute this? First, for a given dyad infant adult pair, we took the time series across the entire five minute interaction, which encompassed all three of those phases I just described, from each nearest channel in the adult's brain and the infant's brain. Then we did some simple pre-processing by um, doing some minimal motion correction and bandpass filtering to remove physiological noise and drift. And then we computed intersubject temporal correlation, which is just a simple Pearson correlation between the signal from one channel in the infant and one channel in the adult, shown here. And for each diode, we did this for every F nearest channel combination. So on the top, I'm showing the intersubject correlation matrices between all 57 
infant and adult channels for each condition. And each cell here just represents the R value from a correlation like the ones I just showed you. Then on the bottom, to test significance of coupling and correct for multiple comparisons, we used a highly rigorous procedure borrowed from fMRI. So the red dots indicate channels that are significantly coupled compared to a phase scrambled null distribution when you average across dyads. Most of these in the prefrontal cortex, and there are a few parietal channels as well. And importantly, you'll see on the right that there are no significantly coupled channels in the apart condition, which is when we turn them away from each other to play with control individuals. And this is actually pretty remarkable because even in that control condition, they were in the same room overhearing the same speech, but they weren't coupled because now they're not directly interacting with each other and attending to each other. So this analysis gave us a sense of the overall spatial pattern of infant adult coupling. Then to assess the temporal dynamics, so what's the relative timing of the two signals, we shifted the adults and infants PFC time series relative to each other across different lags. Then we recomputed ISC at each lag. This is basically another control to check that the two brains are actually aligned in time, and it also lets us see who's leading whom in the interaction. So we take the original signal from one channel in the adult and one in the infant, then we shift those signals relative to each other by varying amounts of time, and in each of those shifts or lags, we compute the ISC value. Now I'm plotting those ISC values across lags. So a peak at zero means that the two signals are synchronized in a time-locked manner, and a flat line would mean that they're not synchronized at all. We see significant coupling in the together condition with a peak near zero. And we never found significant coupling at any lag in the apart condition, which is a good sanity check. But you can see the slight bias toward negative lags here is kind of interesting. It shows that the infant's brain is actually slightly leading the adult's brain. And this seems surprising at first, but as anyone who's been around one-year-olds is probably well aware, they don't tend to sit still and follow very easily. They squirm around, they pick up new toys, um, and get distracted. So we think maybe this pattern reflects adults' tendency to quickly adapt and accommodate the rapid dynamics of infant behavior. In one fMRI study, um, the Stevens et al. study that I mentioned earlier, overall speaker-listener coupling was related to course measures of comprehension, so how well the listener understood the story overall. But one way that we wanted to push this paradigm forward is to address the fact that, especially in infancy, the social behavior is constantly changing. For example, for this infant, in one moment, she's not super engaged. She's looking around, kind of getting distracted. But then in the same interaction, maybe just 30 seconds later, she's very locked in, smiling. You can see her kicking her feet a little bit. So how do we measure um, these dynamics um, from moment to moment, right? How is this child's decision to look away or engage um, at these different time points linked to the adult's neural and behavioral dynamics? So to capture the continuous relationship between brain and behavior in each individual, we first divided the videos from the together condition into 500 millisecond bins. And in each one, we coded whether mutual gaze between the infant and adult was present, as well as infant smiling, and join attention to objects or toys in this case. Um, we also coded the variability of pitch in the adult's speech. So basically in each bin, a measure of how kind of sing-songy her speech was. Then to assess the dynamics of the brain behavior relationship, we performed a similar time-lagged analysis to the one that you just saw. So these are the lagged correlations between the adult neural time series and behavior in blue and between the infant time series and behavior in pink. And the x-axis just shows the relative time lags between the neural and behavioral signals. So the unique temporal patterns that we see across these different analyses um, provide some novel insights into the unique roles that the infant and adult play in this behavioral brain feedback loop that um, enables successful communication. So for example, both the adult and child brains became active right before the onset of mutual gaze. And this happens to be highly consistent with brand new evidence from Talia Wheatley's lab, showing that during conversation between two adults, pupil synchrony precedes eye contact. 
And then in this plot, the infant's brain seems to proceed or possibly trigger an increase in the variability of the adult's pitch or how sing-songy her voice was. Now on the bottom, this is an important control analysis. When we randomly shuffled the pairs, so we were computing coupling across dyads that never actually interacted, these effects disappeared. So this shows that the relationships between brain and behavior actually depend on real time, in the moment, contingent interactions and not some sort of fluke of task structure or something like that. Finally, another thing that's been a challenge in fMRI studies is quantifying the influence of real-time behaviors on brain-to-brain -brain neural coupling, because people can't interact, obviously, when they're lying flat in the scanner. But with NIRS, we can actually look at the contribution of different social cues to ISC. So here we did a partial regression analysis where we separately removed the behavioral time series corresponding to gaze, smiling, et cetera, from the infant and adult signals before recomputing ISC across lags. So here you have the original ISC curve in black. And one key takeaway is that when you remove the effect of mutual gaze, which is a highly rewarding social cue, you get the red line showing a significant decrease in ISC. So making eye contact seems to be an important driver um, in coupling. Um, in, in particular, even more important in driving coupling and PFC than some of these other behaviors, such as jointly looking at external objects, for example. So to wrap up this study, we found that higher order brain areas, in particular the prefrontal cortex in the infant and adult, are synchronized only when the two people communicate directly with each other. We also see that both brains continuously either represent, anticipate, or reflect um, the dynamics of social behavior and the directionality kind of changes depending on which cue you're looking at here. And then our approach highlights the reciprocal nature of brain to brain coupling and opens new possibilities for studying socially embedded naturalistic communication. And at the end of the talk, I'll highlight some ways that we're pushing this paradigm even further to understand the back and forth dynamics of conversation using deep natural language processing models to quantify the exchange of semantic content. So that study helped us understand the relationship between infant adult coupling and a variety of communicative cues. But next we wanted to see whether child-child synchrony as a measure of kids engagement with the moment to moment dynamics of a story can help us understand variability in early language learning. Now to echo something I mentioned earlier, our previous work has shown that synchrony between toddlers' pupil responses while listening to naturalistic speech predicts how well they learn novel words. So here we think that listener-listener synchrony isolates a stimulus-driven response that's consistent across subjects. If you're more synchronized with the group, chances are you're paying attention to the dynamics of story and you may be more likely to learn important information from it. So in this next study, we recruited slightly older kids, preschoolers, who could pay attention to an entire story and sit through a test of their understanding of novel words, as well as more complex narrative structure. We recorded their brain activity again using FNIRS while an adult experimenter read a story to them out loud. And the custom story we used was designed by Ariella Cohen, who was an undergrad in the lab who won a senior thesis award at Princeton for her work on the study. And the story was flexible because it allowed us to control the timing of each page and the appearance of certain words across participants, but within the context of a highly naturalistic interaction. So here's just a schematic timeline of the story, which exposed the kids to four novel words. Um, Tibu, Fum, Koba, and Glark. We kept the story script consistent, so the auditory information was the same across kids, but we counterbalanced which visual objects corresponded to which words. And each object appeared three times. You can see here um, in its first exposure, and then an isolated page with a question, and then later its function in fixing the spaceship was revealed. And then after the story, we tested the kids' learning of the four novel words, as well as more abstract conceptual information about different objects' functions, the location in which different events occurred, and other information about character identities, who was helpful or not, et cetera. 
And fortunately, we saw that kids were learning overall, but there was enough variability in performance between and within question types that we could look at the relationship with neural synchrony. Once again, our main measure here of synchrony is IFC. In the previous study, we computed IFC within each infant caregiver dyad first, um, because the temporal dynamics of those interactions were different across dyads. And then we performed group statistics on the correlation values. But here, because the story stimulus was actually time locked across sessions, the neural responses across children were quite well aligned. And so we could perform ISC between them. So to do that, we simply take the FNIRS time course across the entire story, averaged across all channels in a given region of interest. So here we have sort of frontal cortex in one subject. Then we take the time series, sorry, in the corresponding brain area and the remaining subjects on the right and just average across those and just compute a simple Pearson correlation between those time series. And then we just do that for each region of the brain. Then we took the ISC value for each child, the learning score for each child, and correlated these values across the group. And we first found a strong relationship between child-child synchrony in parietal cortex and overall learning from the story collapsed across the four question types. We found a similar pattern when we looked just at word learning in particular. This is just another way of looking at the same data with a median split analysis, but you just see that better learners show significantly stronger ISC, particularly in frontal and parietal regions, which have been previously associated with high level understanding of social narratives um, involving, you know, these naturalistic kind of story information. So in this study, we found that preschoolers can learn a range of semantic information from a natural storybook, that neural synchrony between children and parietal cortex, a measure of successful engagement with critical moments in the story, predicts their learning. And this approach represents a critical step toward understanding how teaching agents help children's brains extract structure from their everyday learning environments. But this is just a really rich data set, and this is kind of our first pass through it. So a next step is to use computational approaches to understand children's fine-grained representations of narrative structure at different stages in development. And I just want to briefly mention a couple of examples here. So when adults hear a story, we tend to segment it into high-level events to more efficiently encode and understand it. So in this case, you have sort of girl meets alien, alien presents a problem, she goes off to solve the problem, et cetera. But how are children doing that? So some of my colleagues at Princeton have looked at how this works in adults' brains. Using fMRI data from people watching a movie, they modeled the brain's progression through different event representations or hidden states using hidden Markov modeling. And they successfully validated these fMRI data-driven boundaries by comparing them to human annotations of the movie. So when people marked when they actually detected a scene change in the story. So we don't yet understand how children's brains begin to segment this narrative information into high-level events or scenes across development. And I think this will be an important direction for future research. In a recent review paper, we describe a model of how children's representations of communicative information at different time scales become aligned with adults across development. This is based on prior evidence for a time scale hierarchy in adult brains. So specifically early sensory areas like A1 are sensitive to fine time scales, so syllables and words. Um, slightly higher order areas, um, like in this case, STG, um, are sensitive to more sentence level processing. And then the default mode network actually tracks semantic information across longer time scales at the level of an entire story narrative. So how do kids build up these representations through naturalistic interactions like reading with caregivers? I think that using child-child synchrony within different age groups and brain regions could be used as a tool as um, for inferring children's in understanding of different levels of linguistic structure across development. And I'll expand on this a little bit further at the end of the talk. Okay, so next I wanna switch gears a little bit. Up to this point, I've been focusing on verbal communication, but another important medium for human interaction, which is universal and emotionally very rich is music. 
And this provides a complementary lens through which we can study both sides of communication, both producing the sounds and structures of music and perceiving and enjoying them, as well as the coordination between these two sides. So if you think about the last time you attended a live musical event, maybe it was recently, but I know for me, after not being able to play music with friends or attend concerts for many months of the pandemic, um, the first time I sat in a live theater and heard the pure sounds of a trombone choir was very magical. And I felt deeply connected to the musicians and to the other audience members. And I wanna understand this process better. So I'm gonna present an ongoing study um, funded by a Grammy Museum grant in which our ultimate goal is to compare dynamic neural representations of music between expert performers and listeners. And I know I've been promoting the benefits of ethnears for doing face-to-face -face research, but in this study, we wanted to look at hierarchical representations of musical structure, which requires more fine-grained spatial resolution offered by fMRI. So I think that ethnears and fMRI can be used to answer complementary aspects of the same question. And I'll return to that idea a little bit later also. So how do we study hierarchical processing of dynamic naturalistic music? Well, language researchers have done this by dividing a naturalistic narrative stimulus into segments at different time scales, then shuffling those segments and measuring how different brain regions respond to these disruptions. One study presented scrambled stories and found a hierarchy of brain regions responsible for integrating over increasingly long time scales during natural listening. So for example, early auditory cortex responds reliably even for stories scrambled at the finest time scale. So at the word level, every word is shuffled. Whereas higher order default mode network areas, um, you can see here the precuneus, angular gyrus, temporal parietal junction, those integrate over entire paragraphs, basically tracking the long-term statistics of sounds. So across many studies, these DMN areas have been shown to be involved in high-level processing of narrative structure, extracting the gist of an entire story or movie. A similar approach has been used to trace a hierarchy for music perception. And here, conservatory musicians listened to a Brahms concerto scrambled at different time scales. And they similarly found that A1, primary auditory cortex, processed really fast, low level information. And then as you go up into this hierarchy, you get processing of phrase level time scales and then even longer time scales. But what about music production? We don't actually know how this time scale hierarchy for representing increasingly complex sounds connects with the motor system in order to generate actions. So in the case of piano, we have these complex finger movements. As you can imagine, motion artifacts and other practical challenges make it really hard to collect neuroimaging data during live musical performance. So our team came up with some creative solutions to tackle these problems. To minimize head motion, we 3D printed foam head cases based on models of each subject's head. And we developed a custom MR safe piano keyboard containing non ferromagnetic materials. We also rigged up a mirror that would allow the experts to see their hands and the music while they played in the scanner. We also included a pretest in a mock scanner that helped them get accustomed to playing in this weird environment. So we want to understand how musicians' brains represent the fine-grained dynamic structure of music while they perform. So we manipulated those dynamics by scrambling the music they played at different time scales. So here we have the one measure or one bar scramble, the two bar, eight bar, and the full intact piece. This is just a schematic, so the um, colors weren't shown to participants. And this was adapted from a Tchaikovsky suite that was unfamiliar to them. And it was designed to be easy enough that they could sight read it in the scanner. So far, we've scanned four experts. Um, data collection was interrupted by COVID, but we're currently restarting scanning with pianists from the Eastman School of Music. So in session one, we did a behavioral um, pretest in the mock scanner to determine their sight reading ability. And if they passed this pretest, then they were invited back for session two, which was the actual scan. And here we used slightly different music than the pretest from the same composer. So they'd be reading um, fresh in the scanner for the first time. And then they saw lines that looked like this just come up on the projector um, and they sight read along with it 
um, and to ensure alignment across runs, we used a metronome and a countdown for each run. We also recorded their MIDI output from the keyboard and they heard live feedback of themselves via earbuds. So they played each of those four scrambled conditions multiple times. And then we had another condition where they just listened to the full intact version of the piece. We first performed some reliability checks to ensure that we were extracting music related patterns from the performer's brain activity. To give you the gist of those, we found that when we took the time series from runs of the same scramble condition on the left, they were better correlated with each other than runs of different conditions on the right. And we could also decode or classify which condition performers are playing. So collectively, these tests just show that even for the same basic task, the neural patterns are reliably different across conditions and reflect the fine grained dynamics of musical structure. Next, we wanted to see how connectivity between regions changes across scramble conditions. So how do different regions along the neural hierarchy communicate when tracking different time scales of musical structure? Here I'm showing those schematic diagrams of the four scrambled pieces again. As you go to the right, the stimuli get more intact, so longer time scale information is, con is contained there. And then these matrices on the bottom depict intersubject functional connectivity which just tells us which brain areas are reliably connected to each other in a way that's consistent across multiple subjects. So using this manipulation, we uncovered a novel neural hierarchy for music production. Specifically, as the music progresses to longer timescales, you can see that auditory regions become um, more functionally connected uh, to motor regions and then to higher order default mode regions like the TPJ, and also to some other areas like visual cortex. We also explored a new way of measuring the timescale hierarchy within the context of the intact piece by chunking the music into segments that were more directly relevant to music cognition. And Risa Cassano, a grad student in my lab, developed this intersubject pattern correlation or ISPC analysis at four different timescales. So the half phrase or four bar timescale, the phrase or eight bar, and then half section and section. And so these are more directly connected to sort of musical phrase structure in the pieces. And then she did basically a spatial um, or voxel wise analog to the intersubject temporal correlation or ISC, which we were using in previous studies. So here we're measuring how reliable the voxel by voxel patterns are for each musical time scale within the intact piece. And higher reliability across subjects just means that a brain region processes that time scale hierarchy more consistently, that, that time scale, sorry. And more broadly, this is a powerful quantitative method for mapping fine grained neural representations of dynamic naturalistic stimuli. So our question was, well, playing versus listening to the same music, how do musicians' brains represent this syntactic information from short melodies to sections? We found that during playing, shown here in blue, the motor cortex shows the most reliable pattern of activity over shorter segments, suggesting that subjects are chunking what they're playing into more bite-sized phrases. Then during listening in the green dotted lines, Pretty much all three regions show more reliable response patterns over the longer segments, suggesting that subjects are actually able to devote more resources to longer term chunking and prediction so their attentional window kind of expands during listening. Then we're also interested in modeling brain responses based on musical features of the stimulus, such as pitch label or note name shown here. So if we regress out this matrix of note names from the neural signals, how does this impact connectivity between brain areas or neural segmentation of different events? And this matrix just shows the correlation between different phrases of the intact piece in terms of a combination of multiple musical features. So melodic complexity, key, major, minor, mode, et cetera. And we could build matrices containing different combinations of hierarchical features to predict response patterns in different regions. 
Along the way, we want to build new computational models that combine automatic MIR or music information retrieval approaches with more music theory and music cognition driven features um, to help address some of the current limitations of MIR to predict human experiences of music. All right, to wrap up this study, we found that when pianists play music containing only short time scale structure, we see that only auditory areas are reliably functionally connected to each other. But at longer time scales, connectivity between auditory, motor, and higher order DMN regions starts to emerge. And then multiple regions integrate over relatively longer segments of music during listening than playing suggesting that when they don't have to focus on planning the next few notes, musicians can devote more time to longer term chunking and prediction. Then next, um, and this is sort of our ongoing work, we plan to scan a new group of people who vary in musical training while they listen to the same pieces played by the experts. And we predict that performer listener synchrony should be higher for trained listeners and should predict listeners event segmentation, prediction, and emotional processing. So I just want to close by discussing some ongoing work using computational approaches to characterize the dynamic processes that support complex everyday communicative interactions. Now, neural coupling, which I've been talking about, is becoming an increasingly popular approach to understanding communication. And the simplest form of coupling shown here is one-to-one -one alignment or mirroring of, of neural signals between people. And I've described a few examples and applications of that in our past work. But of course, most real world interactions actually demand more complex and dynamic um, and computational models of coupling. And in the infant caregiver paper I've discussed, we have begun to look at mirroring, sort of, sorry, look beyond mirroring to capture some of those dynamics as well. But we want to keep pushing this even further. So as we know, in everyday conversations, the goal is to trade information back and forth, mutually adapt and complement each other, and generate ideas that go above and beyond what each person could have produced on their own. It's basically a form of improv where you sort of have to yes and your conversational partner. So to understand this dynamic process, we need tools to capture the fine-grained statistics of behavioral and neural signals on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. And my lab is currently applying such tools. So with my PhD student, Ruby Zeng, and two of our collaborators, we're currently running a couple of large scale experiments from people communicating online. Here we're quantifying the fine grained patterns of semantic and prosodic coupling that people undergo during these exchanges. And so this is just showing this toy example about restaurants still, but we're using different kinds of conversational prompts in our experiments. So for example, um, we've asked people to improvise a novel story together, either with a friend or a stranger, and also to debate or brainstorm solutions to a polarizing societal issue. So after collecting this natural speech data, we use neural network transformer models. Some examples are BERT and GPT-2, you may have heard of, um, to represent each word or sentence in the dialogue as an embedding vector in a multidimensional semantic space. And that just means we have this, in this case, sort of this one dimensional representation of where that word or sentence lies relative to all other words in the semantic space. Then from here, we can model these trajectories of conversations using different tools like k-means clustering and topic modeling, and also identify event boundaries, again, using something like hidden Markov models. We can then use these structural metrics to predict various aspects of communication success, including how creative, novel, or emotional the ideas are based on independent human ratings. As you can see, there's some interesting applications to problem solving and joint um, decision making here as well. Later, we can use these models to predict neural states that two people flow through over the course of a conversation and hopefully track some interesting um, sort of contingencies between the two brains. I also just wanted to highlight quickly how we can use these same natural language processing models to quantify the semantic structure of real life communicative input, such as child directed speech. So when two different parents read from the exact same storybook, let's say hop on pop, they may improvise or embellish the narrative to different extents, as you can see here. So one parent sticks exactly to the script, 
another parent sort of goes off script and maybe creates some interesting different semantic trajectories. Maybe we can link these fine-grained statistics to children's neural representations and learning outcomes, including some of the variability that you can see in um, disorders like dyslexia or autism. And our review paper that I already mentioned lays out a dynamic neural behavioral coupling framework that provides rich opportunities to study individual differences in learning and development. So in some kinds of interactions, you might actually expect that moments of behavioral tension and possibly neural asynchrony sig sing signal, sorry, creative breakthroughs um, and opportunities for learning. So here we have an adult and child kind of improvising a story together in the context of everyday play. And for example, this highlights how higher order DMN areas may become desynchronized between them as they each introduce new and surprising twists in the plot and then become resynchronized at other moments as they come back to a joint understanding of the same narrative. So this kind of interaction is very different from just passively listening to a story. And it's likely an important part of children's creative development and ability to view the world from different people's perspectives. So I've highlighted some plans for using computational tools to study dynamic interpersonal coupling in the context of conversation, creativity, and learning. And I think this approach has huge potential for better understanding many other aspects of communication in real life settings as well. Finally, I just wanted to briefly mention that uh, my lab is very committed to open science um, to improve the transparency and reproducibility of cognitive science research. Um, I was involved in launching the Princeton Handbook for Reproducible Neuroimaging, um, which is a guide to open source tools for pre-processing and analyzing fMRI data. Um, this is a picture from one of our hackathons. And we also use Brainiac, which is this awesome Python-based open source toolkit for advanced computational fMRI analysis on naturalistic data sets. So if anyone's working with that kind of data, I'd highly recommend checking it out. And finally, I just want to thank my mentors, collaborators, and current lab members on the right, um, our sources of funding. And thank you so much for having me and for listening to my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Elise. That's uh, very interesting. And I, I, I hope that you have some time to, uh, to entertain uh, some questions. Um, I don't know if you would uh, prefer to leave your slides up or to stop sharing. It's up to you. Um, I'm happy I'll, to leave uh, them up if I have to switch back to something. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll ask that uh, people who would like to ask a question use the uh, uh, the reactions uh, button to raise a, a hand please. Uh, and then we can uh, call on you. Okay, I think I see Robert has a question. <coughs> yeah, hi. Uh, that was a really interesting talk. Thanks for that. Um, when you were talking about the sight reading uh, uh, study, I was curious um, whether you looked at any correlation between that functional connectivity within auditory and motor areas and how well that relates to how they actually performed in sight reading. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we did look at a correlation between connectivity and sort of the strength of just um, overall ISC. Um, we didn't see, if, if I go back to that plot, So essentially the difference in connectivity between the four conditions was not correlated with individual subjects difference in performance, which I think was important. Um, overall across subjects, there was a minimal um, decrease as they got to the more scrambled conditions, but it didn't seem like it was related systematically to the difference in neural patterns if that answers your question. Oops, sorry, I was muted. Um, you can't synchronize with me as I, <laughs> I'm muted. Um, thanks, that does answer the question. Can I also ask um, maybe a bit more of a, a conceptual question? Um, yeah, so, so this 
kind of synchronization individual to individual do you see that as reflecting more of a kind of common attention to whatever concept or or um, point of the conversation of, of the interaction or do you see it um like i guess i'm trying to understand whether we should view this as more of um just a, a reflection of of common attention or as something that's actually essential to um successful communication mm -hmm. in and of itself if that makes sense yeah, that's a question that comes up a lot. At what level is this happening? I think to address the sort of common attentional signal, um, I've kind of been of the mindset that this is about joint attention to a stimulus at some kind of level of interpretation, right? It's not about just common bottom-up sensory input because we know from some prior studies that I didn't mention that you can give people the exact same sensory input, but depending on whether, let's say they know that language or they were primed with some sort of context that leads them down an, an interpretation of a character or something, you can actually make people decoupled um, according mm -hmm. to those high level aspects. So you could still though explain that in terms of a joint attentional signal, the people given the same priming context, right? Are attending to different aspects of the person in the story than the people with a different context. Um, in terms of sort of it coupling, having a causal um, influence on behavior, there has been some recent interesting optogenetic work with animals showing that when you induce neural synchrony between mice, um, you get social bonding as an after effect, right? And I think that's a really fascinating direction maybe to pursue in humans maybe with neurofeedback or um, TMS or something to try to see how you can sway behavior through that mechanism. Right, uh, yes, I'm aware of that, so thanks. Don? Hi, thank you so much for that talk. It's really fascinating. Although I confess the part on music, given my utter ignorance of music was a bit challenging for me. Um, I actually work on language change and I've been interested in um, the impact of models of alignment. So specifically the work like Pickering and Garrett's interactive alignment model. And I'm kind of wondering how you would what you would have to say about from the from the perspective of the work you're doing. I mean, how does your work relate to to earlier models of that sort? Um, I guess say a little bit more about sort of the difference in terms of well, I, just Pickering and Garrett's work on an interactive alignment model where they emphasize the automaticity of alignment on all levels of language um, and orientation to an activity and their argument that that adults learn to sort of repress this tendency to align that's much stronger in children. Um, and they sort of have an overlay of an ability to diverge, to, to not align. Um, so it happens in, at levels, phonetics, phonology, morphology, syntax, pragmatics, semantics. Mm -hmm. um, their, their claim is, is pretty strong, but of course the fact is we, you know, we do diverge and children diverge as, as you were indicating, I think, in some of your data. So I, I was just, uh, since you're talking about a dynamic model, it does seem to me that you've moved beyond those kinds of claims, um, that this is a more complex model. But uh, it, I don't know if your work really is intended to dialogue with models like those of Pickering and Garrett. Yeah, I think it's an interesting um, framework to consider. I mean, I don't really know of any work directly assessing this neurally, but part of what we're proposing with this um, review paper is that children may engage more dynamically with some of the lower level aspects of language, right? They might show entrainment to prosodic dynamics over the course of a conversation. Um, but I think we'd have a strong expectation that adults you know, throughout development continue to synchronize very strongly at these higher order levels. Um, there's just compelling evidence from many studies, mostly with fMRI, showing that adults are very strongly synchronized based on um, kind of the 
ups and downs of a narrative, um, kind of where the most compelling, potentially engagement, engaging points of a story are. So maybe it's just a matter of kind of the level of um, entrainment, but you know, people haven't done those in interactive conversational paradigms as much. Thank you. Well, I do have one silly question, if you'll let me be silly. Um, you shared the example of the wheels on the bus go round and round. Is there anything in your research to explain why every child of the planet, it seems, seems to be obsessed with that? I am mystified. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. I don't know. I wonder if there's some aspect of the musicality that aligns well to infant directed speech variability or something, but I don't know. I wonder if anyone's done a systematic acoustic analysis of children's songs. Forgive me for even asking, I just, I just popped in my mind. Thank you it's so true. much. No, actually just to go off of that, we did an analysis based on the three phases and we actually saw that the relationship between neural synchrony and sort of subjectively rated behavioral synchrony, like whether the two people seem really mutually engaged, that was much stronger in the singing condition than the other two conditions. So that's just, that is sort of a special kind of coupling that happens. Thank you. If I can uh, jump in, uh, I had a sort of a more uh, general question, um, not uh, you didn't specifically address in the, the research you talked about here, but I, I'm just wondering about individual differences. Uh, these are all sort of group level analysis. And is there such a thing as a good neural synchronizer, you know, as, a, as like a, a trait or, you know, are these things all uh, relational and there are certain, you know, circumstances that favor it, but not so much variation across individuals and a propensity, for instance, to enter into alignment? Uh, do we know very much about that? Um, that's a good question. I don't think anyone's really looked at that in kids. So doing some kind of longitudinal study where you have the same child in different settings, are they always kind of the best coupled? Um, is there some basic profile of that that maybe doesn't always in, in, even relate to learning ability. Um, the only person I can think of who may have some data speaking to this question in adults is maybe Emily Finn at Dartmouth, who's kind of looked at individual differences in um, this kind of ISC profile, but I'm not, yeah, I'm kind of blanking on what um, specific results might address that question. I think it'd be very interesting to look at um, in development. Cool. I'll, I'll, I'll cover. Yeah, I think it would be very interesting. <laughs> so I hope eventually somebody will. Uh, I'd like to know more about that. Robert? Uh, sort of following up on, on that, um, in terms of individual differences and in people say listening to exactly the same story, at the same time, extracting different information from that story, um, whether you would then predict that uh, the kind of degree of synchrony between those two listeners would be different. Mm -hmm. And could you actually test that, for example, give people instructions like pay attention to this aspect of the yep. story versus that aspect and, and see. Yeah, yeah. Has that been done? Is it has been done. Yeah, that was kind of the study that I just alluded to with the different contextual primes. I think I have a slide on that that I might be able to find in 30 seconds. But um, yeah, Uri Hassan's um, former postdoc, Yara Yesharun, did a study on exactly that in 2017 in psych science. Um, they found that um, if you take, so there was a, I think a um, short story by J.D. Salinger and they chose a story that was specifically ambiguous with regard to whether this character was basically being cheated on by his wife or just being paranoid. Um, so I think I do have this study if I can pull this up quickly. Yeah. Um, so they took half the subjects, primed them with so basically a little paragraph that said, essentially this man is being cheated on versus the paranoia interpretation. Then they had people listen to the exact same ambiguous story in a scanner and indeed they found um, that people were only coupled with the others in their same interpretation group. 
And they also did this really nice kind of nuanced um, analysis of different like social and emotional aspects of the narrative at various time points and showed that those dynamics kind of correlated with the two different groups interpretations um, and the amount of kind of neural synchrony at different times. Very cool, thanks. All right, well, uh, there are no further questions out there. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Elise, for, for, for joining us. I hope eventually we'll be able to do this in, in person sometime. Uh, but it's uh, a fascinating uh, presentation and, and work, and uh, we really appreciate your time. And so thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much for all the great questions, too.